Minded Machines. I've read a bunch of stuff from Androgyny. Okay. Let's look it up. Uh, Phil Archive. Because that'll be under... Um, is that will, will that be under philosophy of sex? Where is that going to be under? Gender. Gen race and sexuality. Click here. Okay. Let's see if, uh, and see if it. How do we spell this? Is this the right way to spell it? Okay, so we've got a few things. Neutra contra, contra alt right Nietzsche. Dionysus as androgynous Black Panther. Post genderism beyond the gender binary. Let's see. I think uh, maybe spell it differently. No, it was right the first time. Um, Let's see. Bodily social co-presence, rehabilita rehabilitating a progressive strategy. All right, let's just see how long this is. This Journal of Applied Philosophy, 10 pages. We can do this. Cool. I can do 10 pages, even though it's a little bit funky of a PDF. One sec, let me get this all uh, hooked up for everyone. Update stream info. Um, there we go. So, and here is the link in the, uh, if y'all want to grab, find this again. All right, and there we go. Now we're off. So, all right, let's not read the abstract. Huh, this is funny. Let's see if I can, no, I'm going to get the, uh, Left side cut off. I'm sorry about that for my little thingies here, but not much I can do at the moment for this. Anyway, here we go. Um, we've got uh, bodily social co-presence androgyny rehabilitating, rehabilitating a progressive strategy. And I think this was in, what is this? This is in Applied Philo uh, International Journal of Applied Philosophy. So that's interesting. Historically, the concept of androgyny has been as problematic as it has been appealing to, especially white Western progressives. The appeal clearly in includes inter alia the opportunity to abandon the opportunity to abandon or ameliorate certain identities, including essentialized femininity and toxic max masculinity. As for the problematic dimension, the central problem seems to be the reduction of otherness, often unconscious and unwitting, to the norms of straight white middle upper class western cis men, particularly because of consequent worsening of actual others' marginalization and exclusion from social institutions. Despite these problems, I wish to suggest that androgyny, as evidenced by the enthusiasm felt for it by many westerners, bespeaks something larger and more important than the concept itself. To wit, there's something in being in the world of many, especially white Westerners, which yearns to di divest the lingering injustices connected to especially white Western identities. The status of the concept of androgyny in present-day social justice-oriented philosophy is a marginalized and complex one. It is marginalized because there is currently almost no discussion of androgyny in the philosophical literature. Well, that's really interesting that, like, this was, this is one of the, f these are the few ones that are actually here. There is almost no discussion. Is this even highlightable? Yeah, okay, it does. No discussion. 
in the philosophical literature. And it is complex because there is tremendous interest today in transgender, which is related to androgyny in complex ways, to which I will return in detail shortly. For starters, the modern concept of androgyny has its origins in first-wave feminism, sometimes called liberal fem feminism. As, Greek as the Greek etymology of the word suggests, andros, man, and gynos, woman. This concept was derived from Greek mythological representations of being who literally incorporated gender and or sexual characteristics associated with men and women. One influential example of this mythological influence is found in Plato's Symposium, where the character of the comedic poet Aristophanes claims that humans were originally two-part creatures, male and female, and that erotic desire manifests the enduring desire to be restored to our other half. The modern concept of androgyny, however, as articulated by first-wave feminists, can be more appropriately described as psychological androgyny. Though I will turn below to several analyses of the complexity of this concept on its surface, it means something like the possession by a man of psychological traits predominantly associated with women and vice versa. Okay, so it is interesting. So we're talking about like androgyny as the mismatch on the psychological level with the um, biological sex of the holder. At least that's what this this author seems like they're going to call it here. Something like the possession of a man of psychological traits associated with women. Fine. I mean, they can do that. We'll just have to see what happens. Moving from these first wave origins to today's era of third wave or radical feminism, androgyny has been eclipsed specifically by a cluster of concepts that has most recently been grouped under the heading of transgender and gender nonconformism. Nonconformism. Can't say this word. Nonconformism, ab abbreviated as TGNC. So that's transgender and gender nonconformism. To unpack this label, transgender refers to a person who does not identify with the gender they were assigned at birth. This lack of identification could range anywhere from a feeling of discomfort or tension with their gender identity, all the way to a strong identification with another gender identity. And anyone who does not fit the TGNC descriptions is now default known as cisgender. So I guess cisgender is the ones who fall. Yeah, so they the ones who are not transgender at that point. Those that do not have discomfort with their gender identity or the one that was assigned to them, I guess. Turning to the other half of TGNC. Infernal says, the more general meaning of androgyny has to do with the possession of physical characteristics of someone from the opposite sex or a physical ambiguity. This author is kind of using their very specific definition. I agree. That's why I kind of repeated that bit about they're using the psychological thing. So, which might be okay, like depending on what their point is. Um, we just got to see where they go with it because as that was my understanding of it too, uh, Infernal. So we'll see um, what they're, you know, what, what they're doing with it. That's all. Turning to the other half of TGNC, a gender non-conforming person is someone who performs their gendered identity in ways that do not fully align with current gender norms in their society. For example, someone who identifies as a woman and lives in a society where women almost always wear dresses or skirts may wear pants exclusively or someone who identifies as gender neutral, meaning that they do not identify with any current gender, might avoid any clothing, accessories, or styling, such as conventional makeup, that is strongly associated with any gender. And says, yeah, they seem to be taking it directly towards transgenderism, but it's not mandatory to connect the two. Yeah, I agree. So, we'll just have to see. Like, I don't know what this person is, uh, where they're going with this at the moment, so... This is just sort of like where they're starting from background things. All right, and here we go. My intention is certainly not to advocate replacing this very recent label of TGNC with androgyny, but merely to justify giving androgyny a seat at the contemporary table for those for whom it is more appealing than the other atypical gender identities. More precisely, I will suggest a new concept of androgyny that I term bodily social co-presence androgyny. As I will relate below, Lorenzi 
Tioli identifies co-presence androgyny as one of three historical types of psychological androgyny. What makes co-presence androgyny distinct in his system is the presence of both stereotypically male and stereotypically female traits in the same person. Where I differ from Lorenzo Cioldi is captured in the adjective bodily social, which registers that my conception goes beyond mere psychological traits to include bodily comportment and social practices. So this is um, bodily comportment. I, wa I want to see what they mean by that. And then social practices also will have to see what they mean. Put simply, a bodily social co-presence androgynous man not only possesses psychological traits predominantly associated with men and women, but these traits are also manifested in and through his body and social practices. For example, he might perform his gender in a generally conventional way, short hair, pants instead of dresses, drinks beer, and watches lots of American football, except that he wears colors and fabrics associated with women in his culture, such as in the U.S. today, pink and lace, engages in activities such as babysitting, and works as a flight attendant. Okay, so that's what this person's up to in this paper. It looks like they want to have a very specific understanding of an androgyny that doesn't fit in with the other sorts of um, labels we have. That's fine. Let, we just got to figure out why they think this is important now. That we need a to re rehabilitate the concept of androgyny uh, among the other uh, terms. Since, to repeat, I am suggesting that bodily social co-presence androgyny is an alternative to the existing frameworks of TGNC, it might be helpful to clarify how bodily social co-presence androgyny differs from both transgender and gender nonconformism. What makes the former different from transgender is that the androgynous man, in my sense, does not experience a misfit or positive conflicts conflict tension with the male gender he was assigned at birth. Instead, he merely wishes to complement his maleness with traits, forms of embodiment, and practices coded as female feminine. In other words, the issue for the androgynous man is not the imposition of an alien gender, but a lack of one or more features associated in some sense by himself or others with women. Turning to gender nonconformism, nonconformism, the difference is that the androgynous man is not failing to conform nor is trying to reject at least at least certain aspects of what is understood by himself or others to be manhood or maleness. Instead he wishes to possess or perform in addition to phenom in addition phenomena that are not associated with men. Okay, now I got it. Here's what's going on. The other labels this author is taking as like if you've got um transgender, you've got someone who is dislikes whatever they were assigned at birth that's how this author is saying it so like if you were assigned male at birth and then you don't like that you and you wish it you wish you had been assigned or it would be correct to have been assigned female at birth um for whatever that's worth and then the um non-conformism is that you don't like it and you don't like to conform because in some sense you're still you're not just like going from one to the other, but you, you fail to conform to what it is to be male today. This is more of a, you want all things all at once. And so instead of being unhappy with anything that like, uh, that you might have been assigned at birth, you are, you like everything assigned at birth, but you, it is not enough for you. So you want both pies instead of one or the other. And you didn't like the one you got. I think that's how this is going. So instead of it's like one or the other and then you want to like switch, this is an overlap. So. And I don't know how much, I mean, I, I'm just cis male. I can only sort of hypothesize about like how people feel about this stuff. But I guess like if there's a significant population of these folks that say look I don't like the one or the other or the way that this is working like as a I don't feel like there's a problem with how I am to be male and but I also want to have the female like things then I guess like this sort of makes this overlap um, a, a more clear label for that. Infernal says, so far I'm not agreeing with the conceptualization of the author, like they're forcing the term to mean something they want it to mean, but not what it really means. Well, to be fair, 
at this point, I don't know if there is what it really means. There is what it historically has meant, and this is not what it has historically meant. They, I think, are trying to, you know, give an updated view of what the term can mean now and how it could still be appropriate nowadays, even though this is not, it is not what it meant in the past. I agree with you there. But that's okay. Like, if it's worth it for people who, like, if there is a population of people that think this way or feel this way, then maybe it's a good thing that, like, you know, they would have a history to uh, pull upon to say, look, this is how we think about it now, but this was kind of, it doesn't fit in with the other sorts of terms. And so we can, you know, draw this history. So I don't know if that's a good idea, but apparently the author thinks it's a good idea. And that's all I got at the moment. Okay. So, at the continuing, let's see where we get with this. At the risk of oversimplifying, what makes him different from the TGNC folks is that where they are in metaphysical jargon, nominalists or irrealists about gender, the androgynous man is a realist about it, although exactly what it is and how he deploys it varies widely from person to person. I make no judgment here as to whether this difference is or should be axiologically loaded, whether that is it is better or worse to view gender as the way TGNC people do or the way I am suggesting aligns with the bodily social co-presence androgynous, androgynous men. Yeah, so basically this is trying to say, look, I think I'm a man and I'm a woman. At the same time, you're not saying I think I'm a man sometimes and then like woman other times it works out better. Huh. Pre-roll ads are on. Run an ad break to disable them. I ran an ad. They better not run a freaking um, another ad. I'd be really annoyed because I did just run an ad break a few minutes ago. Twitch. Be good. Yeah, so... Oh, sorry, that distracted me, but I'm, I'd be pretty annoyed if I ran an ad break and then they're still running pre-rolls. Okay, yeah, so they make no thing if it's better or worse than, like, say, the transgender folks or the, um, what was the NC? The nonconformist folks. Okay, my hunch is that the TGNC view is probably superior. That's interesting. They're, ad they're admitting that, like, they, their view isn't the best. They're saying that the TGNC... NC view is probably superior and likely to become the new norm for gender in the near future. And remember, this is from a few years ago, and I think that's true. This has basically become the lingo as far as I've heard it. But even if that hunch is correct, that does not mean that andro androgynous is not a worthwhile option at present for straight men who would otherwise feel or be forced to settle for what has come to be known as toxic masculinity. By the latter, I mean a traditional or conventional conception of masculinity to throw out white supremacist patriarchal history along the following lines. The diametric opposition of femini femininity, metaphysically superior thereto, characterized by unfeeling rationality, the suppression of all negative emotion but anger, a denial of vulnerability, and the pursuit of psychological and political mastery by any means including lethal violence. So, yeah... So this person wants to, you know, take the old views and see if they can be supplemented. For reasons of both clarity and intellectual responsibility, it is crucial to note the complexity of the history of androgyny and to locate my new conception thereof in relation to the feminist traditions from which it was born. As the aforementioned etymology of androgyny already suggests, its oldest meaning appears to be something like the co-presence of masculinity and femininity. The latter terms, however, as is clear, clearer to the feminists today than during the first wave, are, are at the very least extremely vague and polysemous, polysemous, and at most entirely arbitrary and counterproductive. Yet, like all these words are... There's a lot of different meanings associated with them. It is unsurprising, therefore, that they have been understood variously across the history of feminism as metaphysical and or psychological, as biological or cultural, and as substantial or strategic. Since this original co-presence model of androgyny would appear to allow a man to maintain any desired aspect of his masculine identity while also supplementing it so supplementing those desired aspects with other aspects he understands as feminine, it might be particularly appealing to at least some straight men. 
Speaking anecdotally, this has certainly been my experience for many years now. See, this is what I was wondering. Like, this seems like the ones that want to be, like, masculine might like this because then they can be like, well, I'm also going to do uh, some feminine things. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of, like, metrosexual. Like, metrosexual when you're just, like, when you're in New York, you do as, like, whatever you want. So this is, like, metrosexual. This is metro sexual so this is kind of where i think this uh, author is going i'm sorry about my crud s there there so metrosexual is what we're getting here we're getting people who want to be male i think whenever they want to be male and people who want to be female get to be female but when the desire arises within them they get to you know, add on. Yeah. And Anne Frost says, yeah, like it makes a choice rather than the attributes you're born with. Yeah, I think that's right. And I could see why this would be an appealing view to some people. And I'm sure, like they say, anecdotally, they, the author likes this. It says, look, they might go as a, the sort of uh, historically straight man sometimes, but you know what? That's not enough for them, and they want to be able to, you know, do other things at other times. So it makes it more of a... It opens up the options here. And in that sense, it seems like a... And I can see why that would be an appealing concept to add into things. Like, you just be like, well, I'm going to go with the cis most of the time, the cisgender but not all of the time. And that would be the androgynous, um, this co-presence or whatever they're, yeah, the co-presence model of androgyny. Okay, I can see why that would be, yeah, sounds like a good idea to some people. Okay, there are, however, several important objections that have been raised to the co-presence model of androgyny, put in the form of three central questions. One, does androgyny concern the co-presence of stereotypically masculine and feminine traits, or instead the transcendence of such traits and or categories altogether? Two, does androgyny facilitate greater inclusiveness in feminism, or instead undermine the struggle against institutionalized gendered injustice? Three, does differing access to androgyny as a function of embodiment and social position with wealth, with wealthy white Western men having the most capital to dedicate to androgynous expression make androgyny complicit with patriarchy and imperialism? I was This is what I was thinking. Like, these other ones are interesting, but like, this is why I was like, is this just giving white guys who have all the power their cake and eating it too? Because then they also get to do the stuff like that, you know, that they weren't allowed to do before. So it's like, does this just make it everything complicit? So. Okay. Perhaps some readers will also object that there is some something problematic about the interest that straight men in particular might have in androgyny. Perhaps that is the appeal of androgyny as co-presence is that it allows a straight cis man to assert partial identification with an identity, female, a total identification with which identity is for him ontologically impossible, as well as politically counterproductive. One might think it would be preferable for straight cis men, therefore, to renounce altogether any attachment they might have to masculinity, including not only those qualities in themselves, which is relatively straightforward, but also to the things in the world that are coded as masculine, which would be a much more difficult and complex process. Even if that masculinity list alternative would be ideal, however, I would argue that the androgynous ideal remains a more practical third alternative that is clearly superior to to the currently dominant model of toxic masculinity. So I guess the, what this paragraph is just saying, look, would you get to pick and choose the things arbitrarily? Um, so you can like pick the one, the, the things from like, you know, being female you like, and then you get to cancel out the things you don't like about being masculine and thereby just letting you have at, like just have things as you wish. Um, Okay, maybe there is something else there, too. I don't quite know. Yeah, so you just renounce your attachment to masculinity. That's what they're saying, just renounce it. They're saying, no, the androgynous thing still has a uh, point here. Why? 
Moreover, what it, what, whatever its flaws and shortcoming, shortcomings, co-presence androgyny seems to bespeak something larger and more important than the con- concept itself, namely the opportunity to abandon or ameliorate certain identities that are complicit and perpetuating gender injustice. Even if the reader is willing to entertain the possibility that there is something valuable in the concept of androgyny, they might nevertheless and justifiably object that the term is problematically vague, which vagueness might ex- exacerbate problematic features associated with the concept. To that end, sorting out the good from the bad in androgyny, I now to- turn to a more detailed history of that concept as captured in the secondary literature on the subject in the discipline of academic philosophy. I think this is what something that Anne Fernal was saying was that what he's saying is not uh, what has historically been like associated with androgyny. And so, of course, the author is free to define it as they want, but now they have to argue why theirs is better than the historical, uh, why it should be, why we should use the historical term androgyny for what the author wants as opposed to some new term. <coughs> to begin with, the Swiss social psychologist Fabio Lorenzi Cioldi identifies three phases in the history of psychological androgyny, named namely the aforementioned co-presence along with fusion and transcendence in chronological order. On the oldest co-presence model, in Lorenzi Cioldi's articulation, an androgynous person manifests stereotypically masculine and feminine traits differentially based on the social contest context, often masculine at work and feminine in the home with family. On the subsequent fusion model, the androgynous person creatively hybridizes stereotypically masculine and feminine behaviors. This appears to align most closely with the current concept of genderqueer, non-binary individuals with transgender, if the latter is not understood as leaving gender behind altogether. And on the transcendence model, which for Lorenzi Cioldi is the current one among androgyny theorists, the person experiences the concept of gender as entirely meaningless, irrelevant, and indifferent to their behavior. This third conception appears to align most closely with the label gender nonconforming, and especially the subgroup of those people who self-identify as agender. For the latter folks to reiterate, gender is meaningless and undesirable. Okay, so yeah, this makes... You know, I kind of like this breakdown. I didn't know this was from... When is this from? Lorenzo Cioldi. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I'd have to... We can check on the bottom uh, on, on the uh, things, the uh, references. But I kind of like this breakdown, at least. From Lorenzo Cioldi's perspective, this historical progression of androgyny constitutes a tra- trajectory towards lesser substance in the concept, more precisely as the result of social scientists attempt to resist popular and mythological depictions of androgynous figures, including Plato's in the Symposium, as supernatural and or mon- monstrous. Lorenzo Cioldi's objection to this evolution, and especially to the third current version, is that he understands transcendence transcendence androgynes to be, by definition, scientifically and politically invisible as a group. Put positively, transcendence and androgynous individuals amount to the most atomized individuals at all. In other words, transcendence androgyny removes all the tools and resources with which to construct a coherent subjectivity or group identity, and in his view, such subjectivity and identity are necessary for pursuing social in- social justice. Ironically, Lorenzo Cioldi notes, social justice is the very thing that pulls many androgynous persons away from stereotypical gender. In short, androgyny has evolved to the point where it is too insubstantial and unstable to support social justice work. So that's interesting because it has been the idea of like the different genders has sort of gone in different directions. The people who might be androgynous in the way that this has been historically there's just too few of them they've been sort of cannibalized by the other current conceptions and so the idea that they're you know fighting for social justice they they've been pulled apart by too many different ideas and therefore there is no one left that actually to identify in our political sphere that we could say look these group people need to be protected because they're just going to be crapped on by other people if we can't identify them but we can identify them because the ideas have been pulled too far apart (laughs) 
That kind of sucks for those people. <laughs> Sorry I'm laughing. It's just this is the way things happen. Um, like, this is the way things happen with words. Words just get, um, they get pulled to different meanings over time, and then they lose the old meanings. And that's what's happened with androgyny here, is that it got moved into the sort of transgender and uh, the um, nonconformist terms. And once people started glomming onto those terms, the people that didn't quite fit in with that lost out a little bit. One massively influential feminist theorist who shares Lorenzo Ciolo's concern about the macro level effectiveness of abandoning gender altogether is Iris Marion Young. Most famous for her essay, Throwing Like a Girl, which explores the effects on the bodily comportment of women, women under patriarchy, Young was a groundbreaking philosopher in the area of social justice with the dual emphases on gender and race ethnicity. It is in this vein of gendered and ethno-racial social justice, therefore, that Young takes up her her critique of androgyny. Like Lorenzo Cioldi, though, Young nevertheless affirms the historical efficacy of androgyny at a critical prior phase in the history of women's liberation. Androgyny, she writes, named the ideal that many feminists theorized, a social condition in which biological sex would have no implications for a person's life prospects or the way people treated one another. However, she adds, this ideal of androgyny was short-lived. Although Young views this move to androgyny part of a larger project to abandon gen gender altogether as ultimately positive in regard to identity and subjectivity, she objects as follows. The way that large-scale social structures differentially position people in relations of privilege and disadvantage has been ignored. Okay, so basically, yes, by eliminating the social structures you eliminate the method by which you could you know I maybe sure correct hey thank you uh who is that ever echo nova sky thank you you know i did not realize my picture was in the way i'm gonna put that up here there we go you know nope that's the wrong thing to do i'm going to do this there we go. Now the uh, alerts will be above it. My apologies. And uh, can I replay that? Let's see. Uh, I salute you. There we go. You get to see Max Van Sido. I, I, I had way too much fun making that. <coughs> Anywho. Put in terms of what Young's critique of androgyny shares with... Li yeah, and I hope you're having a good day, uh, Echo. Ever Echo. Put in terms of what Young's critique of androgyny shares with Lorenzo Cioldi's Lorenzo Cioldi's going beyond gender has undermined feminism's positive identity politics bared on a shared group membership. Further buttressing Young's critique, albeit from a different methodological standpoint, is Rosie Bradotti's analysis, analysis of Deleuze's infamous androgyny-related concept of becoming woman. Bradotti, born in Italy and raised in Australia, is a pioneer of women's studies in Europe. Her body of work blends continental French and German philosophy with socio-political theory, especially regarding gender and race ethnicity, focusing on a conception of the subject and subjectivity that is more affirming of difference while still robust enough to be deployed effectively on the ground in pursuit of social justice. In other words, Bradotti's life, life's work is an attempt to address Lorenzo Cioldi's objection regarding transcendence and androgyny, that is, that it has too much postmodern slipperiness and transience to achieve the great modernist dream of justice. In what could be read as an acknowledgement of Lorenzo Cioldi's concern, although Bradotti praises Deleuze's deconstruction of a rigid gender binary along with that binary's negative political consequences, she nevertheless calls out what she terms Deleuze's willful disavowal of the concrete political reality. In said reality, according to Bradotti, cisgender male and female bodies are not equally positioned to empoweringly deconstruct their gender identities. Quite the contrary. In order to announce the death of the subject, Bradotti observes, one must first have gained the right to speak as one. 
In conclusion, for Bradotti, Deleuze becomes caught in the contradiction of postulating a general becoming woman, which fails to reckon with the historical and epistemological specificity of the female feminist standpoint. Thus, Bradotti agrees with both Lorenzo Cioldi and Young that despite androgynous advocates' good intentions and despite some appealing features in the concept, androgyny fails as an effective political tool for social justice. Yeah, because if you are arguing from the spot of nowhere, which is what the androgynous concept is here as a rejection of gender, then, yeah, the people in power who are not androgynous are not going to recognize you because they're saying you're arguing from nowhere. You're not arguing from anything they understand. And so they don't have the uh, standpoint because you can't actually give one. They reckon with the historical uh, feminist standpoint. <coughs> so, one concrete response to this triply affirmed objection from Lorenzo Cioldi, Young, and Bredotti would be that the non essential feminist of the LGBTQ plus movement, deploying the kind of coalition politics advocated by feminist philosopher such as Judith Butler, has scored major victories for the feminist movement. Admittedly, as numerous critics within the LGBT plus movement have pointed out, the different identities represented by the letters of that acronym have never yet been equally represented or respected, especially the B of bisexual and the T of the TGNC folks. This does not mean, however, that women in general have been undermined by the LGBT plus movement in the way that Lorenzo Childe, Young, and Bertorti Warren may result from contemporary feminism's rejection of a stable or essential concept of gender or woman. Even supposing the latter of three theorists' critique is justified, and that we therefore should strategically retain the concept of gender for liberation purposes, this would not rule out refurbishing the historically original co-presence conception of androgyny, as opposed to the current transcendence conception or the intermediary fusion conception. Since the co-presence conception retains some degree of the meaningfulness of traditional gender concepts, nevertheless, other feminists have raised additional objections to androgyny over and above its alleged counterproductive political implications. I will now consider two such theories. All right, so is this fair? You know, the fact that you it's harder to argue for justice from this position well, the transcendence position. They're saying basically this is a this is an argumentative strategy that the co-presence is better than the transcendence view because the co-presence allows for the traditional positions to have a standpoint. And transcendence is to say there are no positions whatsoever. So from a rhetorical standpoint, you can say I understand you. From a androgynous perspective, I understand you, you cis person, because I have what you have. But if you're doing the transcendence view, you're saying, well, I don't have what you have. And that makes it a lot harder to argue for. So they're basically saying it's politically useful, this uh, position. I mean, for what that for what is that worth? I don't know. But they're saying, you know, you can at least have a more politically motivated concept by using this stuff. Okay, Catherine Pauli Morgan argues that in addition to what she sees as androgyny's odious political effects, it is also conceptually an incoherent mirage. That is, any political appeals to androgyny amounts to mere linguistic camouflage. To defend this conclusion, Morgan begins by identifying ten distinct theoretical assumptions made about androgyny, including that it, e it is either psychological or comprehensive, either innate or acquired, and either pan-cultural or culture-specific. She then goes on to explore the disagreements among androgyny advocates from multiple disciplines about these alleged characteristics. Later in her article, Morgan argues that each of these ten assumptions, beyond just conflicting with its contrary term, already tends to self-destruct on its own. Unlike Lorenzo Cioldi, therefore, Morgan thinks... Morgan thinks that none of the three versions of androgyny in historical survey, namely co-presence, fusion, and transcendence, is internally internally coherent. MDD Chiron says, Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown's refusal to define what constitutes women was taken as a big talking 
point for right wingers. Yeah, but I don't actually think right wingers have put any time into reading any of the literature. And I don't know if K- uh, Katanji Brown has either. But legally, from what I understand is a legal standpoint, it's not particularly clear what a woman is in the eyes of the law either. So the idea that she wouldn't do it makes legal sense. But in terms of like, you know, culture wars in the U.S., then it makes ab- absolute sense that they'd ask her on it and then make a giant talking point out of it. Because obviously these are women and those are men. I mean, yeah, I, I know people like conservative people you like it's funny like i feel like they're trying to be honest about how they feel about the world and so when they see someone that looks like a woman that's a woman to them and the idea that like it might not be a woman is weird because you're going against what they like viscerally see and feel and so you're telling them that their experience is wrong of course their experience is not wrong their experience is what they experienced, and that's what it was. But that doesn't mean that's the rest of the way the world actually is. That's just how they feel about stuff. So this is why they do it, because they know they're going to get a rise out of their base, because that's how people feel. And I'm not saying how they feel is right or wrong, but that is how they feel. So uh, am I... How do I feel about the whole like show of the Supreme Court stuff with that? I don't know. I, I looks like Katanji was making the right legal uh, position that how um, gender is viewed in the law is probably complicated, um, but they were you know they were making the uh, talking point. They're, they weren't making a legal argument when they were talking about that stuff. So, but it's an interesting like you know we're talking about the political usefulness for justice here, but like in some sense. That's right where it came up in terms of politics there because they want to hammer down on uh, the like that there is something man and woman. And that's kind of what the author is saying is that if you are androgynous and you're transcending it, then they're going to lose their mind because it's obvious to them that there's men and women. Mitnick from says, yeah, it becomes really difficult to reach out on the fence to on the fencers or right wingers perceptive to change without a unified front. Yeah. And that's kind of what they're doing there. They know that they can hammer on the idea that this is how people are just going to feel about what they see. And so that's why they're scoring political points. And that's the point here that the author is making that, uh, if you're claiming that it doesn't exist, you're just going to lose all of those people immediately because they immediately feel that they see men and women out in the world. I mean, if anyone's out there is like, yes, but I, it makes a difference what I see. Like, remember, duck rabbits, what you see is not, it's not all about like what you see the first time. Like there are more complicated things out there than like just how you like the immediate impression you get and how you feel about it. It's like it, this is just the history of the world. We look at things and we're not always getting the truth just because that's how we feel or that's what we saw things are not that simple (laughs) so (laughs) i I, I appreciate you want things to be simple out there but it ain't so simple so yeah there's a huge range of stuff like i remember a while back not even that long ago someone was saying they were ace which is the asexual crew um which is just like i don't I don't know enough about this, but it's like, yes, how does that fit in with all these other spots? I don't know, but like you have to make space for them. There's people like that, and like, and that's fine. So it's like, it's complicated and people want it to be simple and the world ain't simple. Okay. So continuing and please feel free to ask more questions. It's just like, and I was thinking about like, sorry, I, I just think about like you get these different people in chat from all over the world have completely different experiences. I'm like, I don't have a safe space here because, you know, this is offending somebody right here. What I'm reading, I'm sure it is. But it's like, eh, I don't know. But I read it and we try to find stuff out and try to find out what the good idea is here. And that's kind of what I'm trying to do in uh, philosophy roulette. But <laughs> I don't know if I succeed all the time. I try. 
Okay. Morgan's second objection to androgyny is that it advocate its advocates commit what she calls the black and white fallacy, and which she describes as follows. Assuming that the negation of a particular item or thesis is equivalent to a unique specific contrary. Granting that sexual polar polarization is linked to social injustice, Morgan suggests the following four alternate tools in place of androgyny. And says the simple fact that we're having a discussion is already huge. It is. And the fact that you can do it like this on the internet is great. Although I will say, um, you know, there's hate raids and stuff like that. People don't like the idea we can talk about this. And it gets attacked, like, regularly. Like, just very recently, like, Twitch had to put in a whole slew of new stuff to block hate raids coming from the uh, conservative networks. It's like, they were going in doing stuff like that and like i like i had to go and change my stream setup to be more ready in case that like we were having this sort of discussion and we had some jerks like flooding the chat it's like i had to spend time worrying about this okay so granting set that sexual polarization is linked to social injustice morgan suggests the following four alternate tools in place of androgyny for resisting said polarization a the advocacy advocacy of feminized men and masculized masculinized women without seeking balance or inclusiveness of gendered traits b expanding the number of sexes that we recognize c a stage theory of sex role transcendence and d institutionalized degenderization of all human behavior <laughs> that's a lot of su suggestions in response to these alternatives, I note first that Morgan's option C seems roughly equivalent to Lorenzi Cioldi's three-stage theory of androgyny's history. Thus, androgyny already has a solution to that problem. Second, Morgan's option D summarizes the negative political consequences that Lorenzo Cioldi, Young, and Bredotti all predict if society abandons the concept of gender altogether, and thus her institutionalized degenderization is just as vulnerable as androgyny to their objections. Moreover, thinking my two responses together, it appears that the range of Morgan's use of the word androgyny is much narrower than that of Lorenzo Cioldi et al. Consequently, if Morgan were to accept a version of androgyny that is inclusive as theirs, then her second objection, that is, the alleged black and white fallacy committed by androgyny theorists, would logically evaporate. Yeah, like, basically, if it's, like, so the co-presence, as they were saying, you get some masculine and some feminine, then it's not so clear it's black and white. Morgan's final critique of androgyny homes in on psychological androgyny theorists such as Lorenzo Cioldi, though she does not mention him by name. She criticizes these psychological androgyny theorists for offering what she terms a kind of Cartesian transcendent, transcendental androgyny. To do so, Morgan continues, is to eliminate the body from any consideration whatsoever, and also to either ignore or explicitly reject the social per se. Ultimately and ironically, Morgan concludes by proposing a relatively disembodied, non-social, depoliticized notion of psychological androgyny. Androgynists constrict and disintegrate our experience while trying to accomplish precisely the opposite. As with my response to Morgan's second objection to androgyny, however, if one simply broadens the conception, in this case beyond psychological traits, as does my own bodily social co-presence conception, then this final objection by Morgan to androgyny dissipates as well. Yeah, so if it's not only psychological, the author here says, like, the bodily co-presence, so which includes, I guess, the physical. Dovetailing with Morgan's final critique, targeting only the asocial and non-bodily conceptions of androgyny associated with the current transcend transcendence model, is Fidela Fuchs, I'm sorry how I say your name's Fouché's essay, A Critique of Androgyny. Fouché cites groundbreaking feminist philosopher Alison Jagger in rejecting androgyny in favor of a dialectical view of sex and gender, according to which genuine biological sexual differences can influence social gender differences and vice versa. In other words, Fouché wants to maintain that while A, sex is inherently biological and real, and while gender is inherently cultural and artificial, nevertheless B, by influencing each other, sex becomes partially culturally and artificially as surely as gender becomes partially biological and real. 
Like Morgan, Fouché criticizes what she terms androgyny's idealist dismissiveness of the body. Put differently, androgyny, in her view, is meant metaphysically committed to idealism with its attendant nominalism or irrealism about gender, as I discussed above, and the cost of this commitment is an underestimation and denigration of the body, including what Fouché views as the body bodily dimensions of sex and gender. And I'm with in uh, Infernal here. Like, I had no idea that, um, like, I guess I had a history. I don't know much about this literature, but I, I did not know that like they were really criticizing this uh, psychological view of androgyny and that it may have been ascendant. So like people, this is what people criticize. I was thinking that this bodily thing was what people thought it had like a, that there was more to that. And so they're all saying, Hey, you've not got that right. But I will admit that I had no idea. That's how things had gone. Okay. The author continues, in loyalty to the biological real dimension of her view of sex and gender, Fouché rejects androgyny by echoing all, echoing the call of Australian eco-feminist philosopher Val Plumwood for what Plumwood terms regendering instead of degendering. That is, we need positive new gendered content complete with bodily dimensions rather than trying a la transcendence androgyny to reject gender wholesale. In this vein, Fouché concludes as follows. To assume that androgyny would destroy sexism is rather like assuming that apartheid can be destroyed simply by persuading people to believe that desirable psychological qualities are evenly distributed. The existing political and economic structures would remain intact. The powerful would remain in power. At first blush, this argument from analogy from Fouché, analyzing sexism as anal analogous to racism, which echoes the conclusion of all the previous authors I have considered here, may indeed appear powerful. Note, however, that Fouché assumes here an exclusively psychological mode of androgyny, or an exclusively psychological mode of anti-racism. Thus, one can con one can concur with Fouché that the majority of a society's conscious belief that black and white folks are psychologically equal has indeed not by itself solved racism. At the same time, changes in bodies and social practices, including marriage and childbearing across racial lines, as well as the integration of vital institutions such as churches and schools, has consistently led, historically and globally, to greater racial justice. That is, the more integrated a society's racially identified communities and the more ensuing overlap or mixing of racially coded practices, the less racial injustice in that society. The case is analogous with gender. Yes, the mere predominance of a belief that men and women are psychologically equal may not by itself end sexism, but men and women but men wearing skirts and dresses and women being allowed into institutions that have historically only accepted men, like the Scouts, formerly Boy Scouts, seem poised to make gains for gender justice similar to civil rights movement gains for black people. You know, I was a Boy Scout. The Girl Scouts are a much more honorable um, organization. I think the Boy Scouts did it just because they were losing money. Um, but I could be wrong about that. If someone knows the Boy Scouts correct me but yeah i think they the boy scouts they had to be brought kicking and screaming into a uh, past the 1950s Ugh. so yeah i get i mean this is right in the sense that by just saying that uh men and women are equal solves nothing just saying it you have to do something about it so but i mean you can already see this author has set all of these people up to be uh, attacking the straw man here. The straw man, or the straw androgynous uh, co-presence uh, individual, is the um, is that it's a purely psychological thing. And they were saying with their co-presence that you get the bodily included part of it. And once you do that, then this person's going to be, uh, the author here is going to be able to dismiss a lot of these uh, objections. Okay. In light of the foregoing analyses, I will now recapitulate my modified version of androgyny as potentially efficacious social justice strategy to, to be practiced by straight cis men. It has two central defining traits. First, in sympathy with Lorenzo Cioldi's co-presence model of androgyny, my conception involves the presence of both masculine and feminine traits as these two terms are defined, a fluid 
in a fluid and revisable way by each androgyny seeking straight cis man in his cultural environment. Second, in contrast to Lorenzi Cioldi and other theorists of psychological androgyny, my conception goes beyond mere psychological traits to emphasize the inclusion of bodily and social characteristics. And Fernal says we're not equal, that's the point, but I think that the point was to blur those lines. But now people, including the uh, LGB2 plus people, are obsessed with drawing more divisions, creating more and more segregating categories. Yeah, you know, it is the old political argument that you have to have like a group to like, you know, fight for justice. And so you need like to narrowly slice people up so that or slice up groups of people. Please do not slice any person up. Um, slice up groups of people into different like sections in order to um, create divisions and you create divisions in order to create political work, uh, like stuff to work with. Um, in this case, you know, the person, this person's trying to, you know, pull some of that together, like pull, uh, some of the groups back together saying, look, we could use the androgyny, um, concept to cover some of the things that are, you know, maybe getting dropped out. Um, now is this just another, is this one more thing that we'll just add to the list of that, like, of like LGBTQ plus, uh, things maybe. And that would just be one more standard that would not be good. Would this find a historically backed concept that maybe more people could glom onto, you know, that would like would it be and like and therefore politically useful for more people to join up under androgynous maybe i don't know like that's the question and for me is like is what you're saying is what you're saying that like this is going to be just add an, another and another letter to the acronym which is unhelpful or is it going to be drawing people together hey frog welcome back good to see you Bewitched Frog says, more unified political front versus more categories for people to be represented within the mo movement. Yeah. You think the more, and you're on the more category side. Yeah. Um, I'm not like, because this author clearly wants to have the political um, power to like, to be part of their uh, story here to say that you can identify these people and but I think they're trying to identify a group that has been you know in some sense like spread out into the other uh, groups and so they're trying to still do a unifying thing and so what's interesting here is maybe it's they're kind of trying to straddle the uh, like the gap there like to do both things and uh, I don't know since you don't hear about androgyny too much Maybe it hasn't caught on. Maybe it will catch on. I don't know. But uh, this is like this is like a fundamental tension with the political argument. Okay, you let me know uh, if you have something like I'm not 100% sure exactly what this person wants. They clearly want the political argument or do they just want to get a new group to be part of the larger LBGTQ plus uh, family? And Fernal says, I am the part of that family community, and it seems like every week there's a new term to create more category to one's gender sexuality. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's true. There, there's a lot. And it's not... It's good for those people. Um, you have three million. Wow, that's amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, it depends what you're trying to do. Are you trying to be inclusive and just include everyone being different, or are you trying to get political stuff done? And then in that case, you have to, like, group everyone together so you have a political block. And says, I reckon the point is blurring the lines that divide human beings to, due to gender or sexuality, but more and more groups, labels, and identities are almost manufactured, and that makes things much more complicated and does the opposite. Yeah, it's, it's politically unhelpful. And I got that. And th this is the question is, will we, because we're, this author is trying to, you know, pull a historical term back from, you know, 
like it not being used will that be able to get more people in because it has like a history and more uh to it in some sense i don't oh streck thank you like hands up and you push the bottom you push your chest up and you try and stretch like this you go up and down inside your body so oh. and you turn your hands up like this like you raise the roof elbows out oh, that's good Thank you for the stretch. So, by right, let me continue. We only got um. You see, it's this is the end of the paper right here. Let's finish it up. By bodily characteristics, I mean the things like wardrobe, for example, wearing colors and styles that one or one's culture associates with femininity, personal grooming, for example, wearing one's hair long, wearing face some makeup, fingernail polish, etc., and comportment. For example, gestures, mannerisms, style of walking, sitting, etc., that one, one's culture associated with associates with femininity. Crucially, in order to distinguish my concept of androgyny from concepts such as gender queer and gender non-conforming, the bodily changes in my conception of androgyny are not intended to constitute and not understood by the androgynous person as constituting a wholesale rejection of his masculinity or maleness, nor as constituting a torsion torsioning of masculinity maleness into something that differs from both masculinity and femininity instead this androgyny is understood as the additional of feminine bodily characteristics to his pre-existing ma masculine bodily characteristics as for social characteristics here i mean both a taking a role or position understood by the androgynous man as feminine and b entering into personal and institutional relationships perceived as inherently feminine Examples of A might include listening to another man complain while offering emotional support and reassurance or agreeing to be an adult sitter for a friend's aging relative. Examples of B might include seeking out a friendship revolving around playdates for children or sharing feelings over coffee and meals or applying for a job as a restaurant host or nail salon worker. In conclusion, the meaningful differences that my conception of androgyny introduces as a product of its emphasis on bodily and social characteristics are that C, the androgynous man's gender is visibly perceptually altered, including in social spaces, and D, the difference in differently performed personal and institutional relationship, relationships constitute qualitatively qualitative changes in the political sphere and thus move beyond mere identity subjectivity and beliefs to reach the level of institutional sexism misogyny and discrimination okay so there we go interesting interesting stuff where well, i want to see what this uh lorenzo Cioldi is 1996 okay so this is some a 90s theory of psychological androgyny. I wondered how old that actually was. So that's reasonably contemporary, 1996, for philosophy. Um, I mean, it's not like metaphysics where like Aristotle is still contemporary. But like for this sort of stuff, it's not that far uh, out. Okay, so I guess these are the problems we were just discussing. Is like they, this person clearly wants this to be useful. This is in like applied philosophy journal this is applied philosophy they're saying we should uh rehabilitate androgyny as they say and that would be useful now the question is as we were saying is this actually going to be useful but which says seems to focus a lot on straight man's androgyny how is it useful for anyone else i think this person wants it for to be for basically straight man and straight woman androgynous and you just sort of like switch the words throughout the paper if you want to take this from the straight woman's perspective that she would get to be to take on masculine uh features you can do that too they did that sort of in the beginning um they were saying look you just flip it around for the whole thing um but yeah this is definitely a subset of people that it, yeah, limited in terms of application, as Anne Farnell says. That's absolutely right. This is for the subgroup that like that think this applies to them. I mean, it might apply to you, might not apply to you, but there's definitely it's not going to apply to everyone. I can guarantee that, um, because the transgender and gender nonconformism, the trans folks, the, these are the terms that are I hear the most nowadays. 
So, you know, I mean, that's fine. It seems like what people like to talk about. But they seem, but this person says they don't like those terms. And the reason why they don't like them is because they sort of like the traditional stuff for whatever reason, but they want to supplement. And that's not a bad position because I bet there are more people that are dissatisfied with just the way they are right now. But they are definitely not going to go full on trans or gender nonconformist. They would just like to be able to augment the way they are at the moment. But, you know, then we've got the political problem, as we've just been discussing. Sure, there's going to be a bunch of people that want to do that. Are you going to be able to pull them in and call themselves, that would call themselves this co-presence androgynous that this person, that the author wants? You know, maybe. Maybe you could, and that would pull off, um, like, in an ideal situation for this author. This sort of... um. Yeah, it's only for cis straight white dudes, but I think what maybe the, is really behind this is that they think they're going to pull off some more cis white dudes from just being boringly cis white, um, just like only cis white. Maybe they can get a few more cis white guys to, you know, join the cause here for social justice because they'll realize, yeah, they're cis white, but they would like this sort of ability to branch out a little bit and be a little bit more androgynous so (laughs) vanilla as heck yes (laughs) Uh, you know one of the things i saw i think the and i highlighted it too you know it just doesn't show up a lot in um academic philosophy literature yeah there's nothing wrong with that it's fine it because but I think the person's right. I just haven't seen a whole lot of talk about androgyny. And so the fact that it's vanilla as heck might be um, a good thing because you need to start somewhere that's not like completely off in their own corner because then it just won't get published in like the philosophical literature because the philosophical literature is inherently uh, risk averse. It just does not do anything. You can be radical up to a point, but if you're too radical, it's like, well, go publish in some like gender studies um, journal, not journal of applied philosophy. So yeah, I got no problem with like being vanilla. It's just, what are they trying to accomplish here with their vanilla account of things? Um, yeah, and I think it's fine. I just don't know. And Phil says sociological literature in the matter goes deeper for sure. Scientifically. Yeah. And I, I would suspect that the reason this is in a philosophy ju- uh, journal is because the, the way they're just doing the historical and social analysis um, and semantic analysis. So it's doing some sort of uh, coming up with a, a different sort of concept that they can justify in terms of argumentation and not like the science or the sociology of it. Um, so they're saying that this would be politically useful because it gives a standpoint as from a masculine or feminine position that it would bring more people in to the androgynous label, even if it isn't strictly what has been historically understood as androgynous. And that would be good for just general social justice overall. (sighs) Yeah, so I don't have, I mean, I just don't know a lot about this literature. I deal with, um, you know, the trans nonconformist people every so often. Androgyny is queer nonetheless. Straight men getting to keep their proximity to straight cisness is just an illusion of the team, I think. Illusion of the term. You know, they said that. They were, wor- I think they mentioned something about, like, one of the objections is basically saying, look, you're just getting to have your cake and eat it too. Um, I have not read Judith, Judith Butler. I've seen i've listened to her talk i have not read much of her stuff like the uh gender studies is not something i've spent any time on whatsoever really i'm off in uh metaphysics um so like this stuff is not my uh like anything politics like politics ethics and uh like gender like go bug uh aristotle for stuff like that i do uh philosophy of science, philosophy of logic, metaphysics. Um, I've just not read, uh, this is where I've spent my time historically. Oh yeah, but uh, talking to Frog again, 
Um, they said that basically they mentioned, look, their account may seem like the cis people get to have their uh, cake and eat it too. And you know what? I think they're okay with that. And I think because, um, where was that? Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it, but basically what they're going to say is you're having, your, you're just giving stuff to the people in power anyway, and nothing's actually going to get fixed. And I think their position is no, it's better for that, um, to, you know, recognize that this is a group of people and you're trying to pull more people into the, uh, the LBGTQ community by saying, Hey, look, if you want to be a basically a cis man but then you also get to do other stuff then you should at least be recognized as androgynous in some way and if you can do that then you're going to get people to do uh to be part of the group now again they said look the psychological just recognizing it clearly doesn't do anything but they're hoping to you know change that over time yeah so they were talking about judith butler um here but i have not read judith butler sorry Uh, yeah anything else for now I mean I don't know I, like I said I just don't know enough to say anything particularly smart um what's funny is this what was this um this person Val Plumwood I think I was reading actually Val Plumwood's husband I, I don't quite know off the top of my head I could look it up but I was reading Val Plumwood's husband, who was a radical metaphysician, not that long ago. Um, Richard Sylvan. I think Plumwood married Val. Um, yeah, because he was an eco-feminist. Uh, he was yeah, a radical ecologist. And they went off and they... Uh, oh, thank you, Anne Fernal. They went off and they started basically, you know, a little... Lived out in the woods, Val Plumwood. So I was literally reading stuff by her husband lately but that was in the metaphysics area so okay um i guess that's it for now then let's go see if there's someone to raid